All right. Um, today, today, we're going to be continuing our series in the Gospel of John. We're finishing out John chapter 5 today. And uh, where we're picking off today is where Jesus left off last week. He was having a conversation with the religious leaders, with the scribes and the Pharisees. How many of you remember what Jesus told uh, the scribes and the Pharisees last week? Maybe I ought to just flip back to last week and do that one again. Remember Jesus, he, he made some um, incredible statements about himself, some incredible claims. And what got this conversation started was he healed a man on, on the Sabbath. He had healed the lame man. How many of you remember that? There was a man who had been lame for 38 years. And Jesus went to him and said, hey, dude, why, don't, why are you laying around? Why don't you get up? The guy said, all right. And he, Jesus healed him. The guy got up. And he didn't leave. You know, he was laying there on his, on his bed. So he made up his bed. His mom taught him well. He made up his bed and he went on his way. Well, believe it or not, this broke some people's rules about what you could do on the Sabbath. And so the, this, that miracle kick-started this conversation. And last week, Jesus made some incredible claims about himself. He said, my father is working and so am I. He said, whatever the father does, I do. He says, the Father shows me everything. He said, I have the power to give life to whoever I want. He said, whoever does not honor me does not follow God. And it, and it enraged these religious leaders because it says in verse uh, 18 of chapter 5, Jesus was making himself equal with God. And so we pick up this conversation uh, of, of these astonishing claims that Jesus made. We're going to pick it up in verse 30 today. And Jesus is going to continue to make these claims about himself to the religious leaders. As you find that in your Bible, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had an experience like this? You're, you're reminded of a verse or you're reminded of something in Scripture, and so you go and you get your Bible to look it up. But you can't find your Bible. You've, you've misplaced it. You've lost it. The place you knew you put it, it wasn't there. And so you begin searching, where is my Bible? We don't have to do that so much these days because we can just pull out our phone or our tablet or go on the computer or on our watch or whatever it is these days, Google it and search it. But uh, I remember days where I, I was looking, wanted to look something up in scripture and I had to go find my Bible. How archaic, right? The stone ages. Um, and so you go and you begin searching, you begin looking, where is my Bible? It's not there. Well, no, well, maybe it's here and you finally find it, and you realize when you find it, oh my goodness, I put this here a week ago, two weeks ago, a month ago, two months. You know, depending on the level of dust that has accumulated on the cover. And you all of a sudden are filled with this conviction, has it... Has it been that long since I read the word? Has, it, ha, have, has that many days, have that many weeks, have that many months gone by that I haven't cracked the pages of God's word, of the Bible? How many have ever had an experience like that? I, I, I have. In fact, you're, you're not alone. I, I'm describing my own experience from my teens and 20s. I mean, that was just kind of the way it went for me. And I, I had some misconceptions about the Bible that made it, made me reading it, made it, made my reading of the Bible difficult. And so uh, over the last couple of years, I've learned some things. I've come to see some things in Scripture that has, has, 
caused my love and my passion for the Word of God to be ignited. And so today, my hope is to share with you some of those things. And certainly we're going to see Jesus. Jesus is actually going to teach us today in the Word of God about the Word of God. How many of you have ever been reading the Bible and you think to yourself, what is this about? What in the world are they talking about? What is this all about? I think all of us at one time or another, we've said, what? I just read how many chapters and, and what is this? How am I, what am I supposed to do with this? I know it's in English, but I might as well be reading Greek. I mean, this is difficult to understand. I want you to know, if, hey, my KBI people, you ought to know, what is the Bible about? Jesus, right? So the Bible is all about Jesus. That's the punchline today, and that's where we're going to be going today. But say, can you say with me, it's all about Jesus. That was very, very disorganized. <laughs> One, two, three. I'm not going to try again. That, you don't get a third strike, all right? We'll just leave it at that. It's all about Jesus from the beginning to the end, from the first verse to the last verse. The Bible's all about Jesus. And, and when I began to see that, when I began to realize it, all of a sudden, the Scripture became alive to me. And so as we get into the Scripture today, Jesus is going to tell the Pharisees this. He's going to say, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is they that bear witness about me. Jesus is going to tell them, you're, you're missing the point in your study of scripture because it's pointing to me. It's all about Jesus. Actually, Scripture tells us that if we read the Bible in any other way, it's, it's detrimental and harmful to our faith. In Peter, uh, the Apostle Peter, he talks about people who, who twist the Scripture, who, who bend it, who take the Scripture and pull it out of context and use it in such a way that it wasn't intended, use it in such a way that doesn't point to Jesus and in so doing, they do it to their own destruction, it says. So today, we're going to consider what the scribes did wrong and what we need to do as we approach the Word of God. We're going to discover how to receive the most out of God's Word today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Word. What a joy it is to have your Word so prevalent Everywhere we go, we're, we have your word and access to it. Father, ignite this truth within our heart that the scriptures, that the Bible, that your word is all about your son, Jesus. Let us see it so clearly as we never have before. And let this truth ignite a fire within our hearts, a passion for your word. May we be known as people of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start today in, in verse 30. And Jesus is going to give four witnesses to himself. The scriptures are going to be one of them, but he's going to start by answering the Pharisees' questions. And they say, what, what authority, authority do you have to tell this man to rise up and walk? What authority do you have to heal somebody? Jesus is going to give us four witnesses that point to his authority. And the first one, and, and we're going to start in verse 30, he says, I can do nothing on my own. <clears throat> As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus is saying, I'm, I was sent here by God the Father to accomplish a task, to accomplish his will. I'm not here seeking my own will. And we're going to see that when we get to John chapter 17. That might be the year 2030. I don't know when we're actually ever going to get there, but we will one day. And in that chapter, we will see Jesus say, as he's heading to the cross, not my will, 
but your will be done. Jesus is a man on a mission sent by God to accomplish the will of the Father. Jesus says, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. What Jesus is saying is, if, if the only witness I have to give is what I say about myself, that's not a very good witness. That's not a sound witness. That's not, it, he's, Jesus isn't saying that he wouldn't be telling the truth, but he's saying it, it wouldn't be uh, bulletproof. How many of you ha have had somebody tell you a story and you're just like, is anybody else there to see that? Because I just, I don't believe it. That's just, <laughs> it's, you're not telling me the truth. And so what do we seek? What do we look for? We look for another witness. Who can, who can confirm what this individual is saying? And so he's going to tell us about four witnesses. In verse 32, he says, There is another witness who bears, for there's another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony he bears about me is true. You sent to John. He's talking about John the Baptist, remember? You sent to John, and he said, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you might be saved. I want to pause there for a second. Sometimes when we read the scriptures, especially when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees or the scribes or the religious people, his tone can be sharp sometimes. It can be cutting. He can even rebuke. But here he tells us, why he tells them these things. He says, I say these things to you so that you might be saved. The, 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 the reason Jesus talks to the Pharisees in the way he does and says the things that he does is because he loves them. Sometimes it can seem like it's the Pharisees against Jesus and Jesus against the Pharisees. But here Jesus is telling us that, no, the reason I tell you these things is because I love you because I want you to be saved. I'm giving you the truth so that you might be saved, so that you might have eternal life. And so for us to know the truth and withhold it from somebody who needs it is very unloving. To know the truth and to not share it is unloving. So if we know the truth about Jesus and how to have eternal life, then we don't share it with people who are in darkness, with people who are dead in their sins. Do we really love them? Do we really care for them? Because if we know the truth and we don't share it, how unloving is that? Here Jesus says, I tell you these things so that you might be saved. He cares for them. He loves them. He's going to die for them and their sin. Jesus, his motivation in the way he speaks is love. He goes on to speak about John the Baptist. He says that he was a burning and shining lamp. And you were re willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony I have is greater than that of John. So the first testimony is John. The second testimony he gives us is greater. He says, the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. What authority do I have? Look at the works. Look at the healings that I've done, the miracles, the signs, the wonders. They bear witness about me that I'm the Son of God, that I've been sent by God the Father. The works bear witness about me. Verse 37, he says, And the Father who sent me has himself bore witness about me. When Jesus was baptized and he came up out of the water, water, God the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. An audible voice from heaven. Man, I would have loved to have seen that baptism. That would have been awesome. The Spirit descending, God speaking. God himself, the Father, bore witness about him. He says, his voice you have never heard, 
His form you have never seen. He's going to move on to the third witness. This is going to say, and you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe the one whom he has sent. To believe in Jesus is to have the word of God abiding in us. We've believed on it. We've, we've heard it. It's ignited our faith. And the very word of God as believers is to abide in us. The mark of someone who has the scriptures is, is a person of the word, is someone who believes in Jesus. This is an incredible accusation that he makes because these are the Bible experts. These are the people who have spent their entire lives searching and studying the scriptures. And Jesus is saying, you don't know your Bible. If you had a question about scripture, these are the people you went to. If you didn't know how to interpret or apply this, this law or this command, you went to these people. Jesus says, you don't know the Bible. Verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. The first problem that they had was their approach. They approached the scriptures in the wrong way. They approached the scriptures thinking that in the very words they could have life, by studying the words and by doing the word that they could have life, that they could use the law to gain their right standing before God, that they could follow the commands in such a way that it would impart to them eternal life. Jesus says, it's the scriptures that point to me. You've, you've approached them with the wrong intent. It's kind of like if, if all of us were able to and we got in a bus and we went downtown and we went to the Hemisphere Tower and we went up to the top. How many of you have been to the top of the Hemisphere Tower? And it just so happens that we're up there at the top of this tower at sunset and we look across over the city at this expanse. Can you advance uh, two slides? I'm sorry, I have this out of order. Go ahead, one more. There you are. We look across our beautiful city. And we see this creation that God has made. And we begin to marvel. Isn't this beautiful? Isn't this wonderful? Isn't this marvelous? Isn't this glorious? Isn't God's creation amazing? Isn't it uh, incredible how he puts on for us every night this display of his glory and his magnificent, the greatest artist to ever live, paints a brand new painting for us that moves and, and the shapes conform and the colors disperse and explode. And as we're sitting there marveling at the sunset, at the creator, somebody comes up next to us. And they say, isn't this marvelous? And we say, yes, it is. Isn't this glorious? Yes, it is. I wonder who created this. Huh, that's an interesting question. I wonder who made this. I wonder where they bought this and who installed it. Wait a second. Wait, what are you talking about? I'm talking about this window. This beautiful window frame. Isn't it marvelous? Isn't it glorious? Look at this window. Have you ever seen such a marvelous window? Look at these glass panes. Look at the way they sealed it. Look at the way the, the arches are there. Isn't this window phenomenal? Isn't it glorious? And we're going to sit there and we're going to say, the window's only there so we can see the sunset. The window's only there so we can see out, so we can see through it. And the way the Pharisees approached the scripture was this love and this marvel for the window, but not what it pointed to, not what it showed them. You see, it's not about the window. It's about what the window shows us. And the scriptures are a window that show us Jesus. 
and that peering into them, we can see and we can know the very Son of God. But they didn't see it. They marveled at the window. They were not able to look beyond it and to see what it pointed to. He, co- he continues in verse 50, uh, 41, rather. But I know that you do not love, have the love of God within you. What an accusation. First, you don't know your Bible. Second, you don't have the love of God in you. I know that you don't have the love of God in you. We can, we can see that by the way they reacted to this poor lame man who was healed. They would have rather him stay lame. I know that you don't have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name. I have come in the name of God, and you do not receive me. If you had the love of God within you, you would receive me because I have come in the name of God. Yet you don't love God. What do you love? He says, if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. If another comes to do his own will in promoting himself, you receive him. But you don't receive me who came in the name of the Father. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Here we see the second problem that they had. It was a problem of motivations. In their, in their devotion to the scripture, it was for their own ends, for their own glory, seeking their own promotion seeking the the applause and the adoration of people and not the glory of God. Not the glory that only comes from God. You know, you can do the right things for the wrong reasons. You can do the right things for the wrong reasons. Motivations matter. The reason we do something is just as important as what we do. Motivations matter. They reveal our heart. We have to ask ourselves, are we seeking God's glory in what we do? Or are we seeking our own glory in our giving, in our serving, in our loving? Are we seeking the glory of God? Are we pointing to him or are we pointing to ourselves? Finally, in verse 45, we see their third problem. He says, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father... There is one who already accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. Moses was the one who had written the Old Testament law, the scriptures that they studied. He's saying, Moses, in, in front of Moses and according to his law, you stand condemned. 46, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? He's saying, you don't know your Bible, you don't love God, and you don't even believe the scriptures that you profess to be a teacher of. You don't even believe it. If you believed it, if you believed in what Moses said, if you really believed the scriptures, you would believe in me too, because they're all about me. Astonishing claims that Jesus makes, and it's a tragedy, it's a tragedy that so many people could study the very words of God, could have the very words of God, yet not know God, yet not be able to see through the window and to see that it's all about Jesus. So how do we not fall into the same trap? As us as believers, how do we not fall into the same trap that they fell into? The first one, I already told you, we got to know that the Bible's all about Jesus. The Bible's all about Jesus. It's always pointing towards him. It's always talking about him. And it's always pointing back to what he's done. So as we get into the Old Testament and we see the 
the sin that enters the world. It's pointing forward to the day when sin will be finished, when Jesus will be victorious. When we see the sacrifices that they had to make, we're reminded that Jesus is our once and for all sacrifice, that we are cleansed from our sin. As we get into the New Testament, we look back and we reflect upon the work that Christ did for us and how we ought to live in light of it. It's all about Jesus, every single chapter, every single verse. And so if we're reading the scriptures in such a way that does not point us to Jesus, we're, we're on the verge of falling into that same trap that the Pharisees fell into. So when I open the scriptures, I open it with the intent of, I want to be like Jesus. I want to learn about him. I want to know him so that he could make me more like himself. It's all about Jesus. The second thing that we need to know about the Bible is the Bible is how God speaks to us. The Bible is how God speaks to us. Think about it. God had this book written. It's inspired by God so that we might know him. God has revealed himself to us on the pages of this book so that we could know him and that in knowing him we could have eternal life. The Bible is how God speaks to us. We need to be careful that we do not neglect the word of God. You know, sometimes we can get caught up in the charisma of certain people and I've seen people bounce around from conference to conference and from church to church in search of this prophet or that anointing or this move of the spirit and neglect the very word of God the very word we need to be careful that we don't do that because the word, the word, the Bible is how God speaks to us. We speak to God through prayer. And he speaks to us through his word. I can't tell you how many times I've needed a breakthrough. I've needed a word from God. I've been stuck. Couldn't figure out which way to go. A mountain in front of us. And I pray and I open the word and there it is. There it is crystal clear, and all of a sudden, it's, it's settled in my heart, this is what we have to do. This is what we have to do. Yeah, we're facing a mountain, but this is the way we're going. God has given us his word, and we're moving forward. This is a resource for us as believers. Open the word. Let God speak to you. It's a weapon that we fight the enemy with. When Jesus was tempted, the three times he was tempted by Satan, three times he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. The Bible, God's word, it's, it's supernatural food to our spirit. And so as we've been born again, as we have new life in Christ, as we've been made to be alive, when we read the word, it nourishes that spiritual man. It, it makes it a stronger so that we can stand against the attacks of the enemy, which, which are coming, which are already here, which many of us are already experiencing. It strengthens us. It gives us resolve. It also cleanses our soul. Uh, daily, we are bombarded with sin with messages, with media, with temptation that lodge in our soul. That's our thoughts. That's the things we want, our desires, our emotions. That's where the battleground is. The Bible says that the word, it cleanses us. Opening the word is like taking a shower for your soul. It, it cleanses it. It gets rid of all that junk. Wipes us clean again. So it strengthens our, our inner resolve. It strengthens our spirit man. And then it gives us the power to win over sin, to win over the enemy in the area of our soul. We've got to be in the Word. 
Thirdly, we study the Bible for transformation, not just information. When we come to the Word, it's so that God might transform our hearts, so that He might make us more like Himself. Not so that we can be the best at Bible trivia or win the debates or demonstrate how great our Bible knowledge is. That's what these people were doing. They were seeking their own glory. When we come to the Word, we come to be transformed by the very Word of God, to be formed and fashioned into His likeness, into His image. So when we open the Scriptures... We pray, Father, transform my heart by your word. Do your work in me that I'm so desperate of. I need a word from God today. Transform my heart. Make me more like you. In Hebrews 4, it talks about how the word of God is alive. It's active in our lives. It pierces our hearts. It, it, it reveals to us our motivations that it separates the, the soul from the flesh. It makes things clear. God uses the word to do surgery in our lives, to do surgery on our hearts. Not just to fill our heads with information, but to transform our hearts. Fourthly, we let the Bible work on us before we use it to try and work on others. We let the word work on us before we try and use it to fix everybody else. We're so good at spotting out everybody else's sin. I'm an expert. You want to know how you're sinning? Come talk to me. I can tell you right now. We're an expert at seeing everybody else's sins, everybody else's problems. Oh, we got to let the word work on us we got to let the Word do its job on us before we can try and use it on others. You see, none of us will ever get beyond the point that we need God to work on us. In this life, we always need God to work on us. We never mature so much that we just say, everybody just look at me. We always need God working on us. The scripture uses the analogy of the potter and the clay. God is forming us. He's fashioning us. Sometimes he builds us up and, man, he's got to smash us back down and build us up again. He's, he's working on us. He's forming in us the very nature of Christ. And he uses his word to do it. The Christian life is about making progress. It's not about attaining perfection. The Christian life, the life you live right now, is about making progress. It's about taking one step at a, at a time, daily being formed more and more in the likeness of Christ. But in this life, until glory, we'll never achieve perfection. And so we, we need not be discouraged that we're not perfect. We need not be discouraged that we still experience temptation. We need to look at our lives and say, are we making progress? Am I moving forward? If I'm not, if I'm stuck, I probably need to be spending more time in the Word. So, wrapping up today, what do I want you to know? I want you to know Jesus. <laughs> it's all about Jesus. From the beginning to the end, I want you to see that this is how God works in our lives as believers. That this is the tool he uses to form us and to fashion us into his image, into his, his likeness. And if you don't know Jesus, who this Bible was written about, I want you to know him. I want you to experience him. I want you to not get trapped up on the word, and I want you to be able to look through it and see who it's pointing to, which is Jesus Christ. The Bible was written that we could know God. Sin had separated us from God, but God came to us in Jesus Christ. 
died on that cross so that we could have our sins forgiven, so that we could be made whole again, so that we could have our lives redeemed and restored, and that we could eternally spend our lives with him. Why don't we stand today?